So shall we get started for today? Um, with the news of not opening uh, anytime soon, I've decided to extend these sessions. So we were scheduled to finish uh, 21st of May, I think was supposed to be the last one. Um, so we're almost at the end, but because we've got apparently a couple more months to go, I've decided to extend them a little bit more just to give you something to, um, to do in the meantime. So instead of doing the full Italy today and breezing through it like we were in the past, we are just going to cover the basics of Italy and then Piemont. All righty then. So let's start with history of Italy. Um, I hope you've all heard of Asterix and Obelix, <laughs> um, but they're not just there for fun. So the way uh, wine got started in, in Italy was actually with the Greeks first. So the Greeks brought it over, they brought it over to Sicily and they started planting grapes and stuff. And then when the Romans finally took over, um, they started planting their own vineyards and they kind of really, really emphasized the, the viniculture in, in all of uh, Italy actually. So Italy is quite special because um, you are the only country in the world that grows um, grapes in every single um, province. So that's quite quite interesting. So the Greeks and the Romans were the first ones that started it out. But where it really kicked off for Italian wine was with the merchant republic. So, you know, Venice was a republic, Sardinia was a republic, Lombardy and so on. Uh, and all of these republics traded among each other. And this kind of encouraged um, progress, encouraged uh, production and so on. So Italy really, really got into a hang of it. Um, more so than any other country, Italy took wine as its main beverage. Um, so it, it was even drunk more than water, mainly because it was blended with water. So even kids were drinking, in Italy were drinking um, wine blended with, with water. I don't know if this is still a word, um, bevanda, do you still call it like that in Italy, Italians? Well, bevanda is, uh, now is like any, any beverage called bevanda, like a light drink. Usually, okay. like soft drink. Okay. You call it as a bevanda in, in any menus in restaurants or bar, you call it, you find as a under okay. bevanda. So that's interesting. Yeah. From in, in other countries that I've heard of, uh, basically, when you say bevanda, it just basically means uh, part wine, part water. Um, but yeah, look, this is where probably uh, historically it originated. Like I said, the kids were drinking this stuff. Um, main reason for this was because when the Romans brought, it, brought um, wines over, they were also uh, bringing the aqueducts and everything, right? Well, not over, they were there anyway. Um, but they were building these aqueducts. And as the aqueducts were, were moving water around, they were very, very slow. So the water was standing in these aqueducts and it just became nasty. So it was full of bacteria and stuff like that. Um, as you can imagine, if water stays in one place for too long. Um, so they had to drink anything other than, than, than that water. And this is where... Um, this is why wine um, became so important. The other thing why the Romans were important in terms of, of wine was because they also, they were the first ones to understand that wine brings out something else in you. Um, so when they went into war, when they went into to, to the battle, um, the, the soldiers had to drink three liters of wine every day. So that was quite interesting. This was kind of like a, a little bit of, uh, somebody said it in one of the movies, um, it's like a doping, right? So it made them more aggressive, it made them more fearless, uh, and they ended up winning more battles. That's obviously until they met Asterix and Obelix. Um, anyway, so back to the Merchant Republics. So uh, they were obviously important for the trade and stuff like that. Um, but as time went on, the Merchant re Republics were taken over by other entities, so other other people were in charge of them. And one of the main people that were uh, important specifically for the Northern part of Italy were the Austrians. So the Austrians were, were, they owned or they ruled over Veneto, Lombardy, Emilia Romagna, um, even Liguria, I think. So uh, that's quite an interesting corridor to, to, to have. And you can see it here in the picture. Uh, and especially this was the problem for these guys over here. So uh, the guys in Piemonte. So the problem for them was because on one side they had the Alps, so trade going westward wasn't really an option. 
Um, so they had to rely on trade going east. So to Lombardy, to Emilia Romagna, to Liguria and so on. Um, but the Austrians uh, wanted to make money off of that. So they, they doubled the tariffs uh, on imports and that pretty much forced the, the, the they crumpled the, the, the industry, the, the wine industry in Piemonte. Um, so this actually resulted in Piemontese uh, fighting and uh, they started a war with the Austrians and this ultimately led to uh, what we now know as the territory of Italy. So in 1861, um, they were finally united with King Emmanuel II, I think it was. Uh, he was the king of Sardinia that united all of the provinces of Italy into what we know today as Italy. Um, so they defeated the Austrians and so on. Anyway, going forward in time, um, Italy was a kingdom at that time. Now, why am I talking this about wine? Who cares about this? Well, it's very important because, like I said, the king was King Emmanuel uh, II in the first place. Um, and he was from uh, Sardinia and he was based in, well, he wasn't from Sardinia. He was from Turin, uh, but he was the king of Sardinia um, originally. But because he was based in Turin, because he was based in Piemonte, this is the region that he focused more on in terms of wine, uh, because obviously he wanted his home local region uh, to prosper. And a lot of the focus in winemaking went into this. So they kind of uh, surpassed all of the other regions uh, quite greatly. Um, and that's still the case today. Arguably Piemonte is the most um, prestigious of all of the, the regions uh, that we have. Okay, anyway. Uh, you were a kingdom uh, for a long time until the end of Second World War, then you became a republic and, and that's it. Okay, now off to Piemonte. So Italians, what does Piemonte mean uh, in literal translation? Uh, the feet of the mountain. Feet of the mountain, yes, so Piedi, Piedi di Monte or foot of the mountain. Um, on the picture, you've got the, the the city of Turin, and obviously you can see it's right underneath the mountains. Fantastic city, great football team. I uh, love my city, beautiful. <laughs> Horrible city, yes, I agree. It ruined, oh, the, whole, it ruined the whole landscape of, of the region. Oh, shut up. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of geography, uh, we are talking about similar latitudes to Bordeaux, right? So when we talk about Bordeaux, we talked about kind of this um, oceanic moderate uh, climate. So actually you get very similar summers um, in Piemonte region that would get in Bordeaux. But obviously there are two uh, main reasons why, um, why it's not exactly the same as Bordeaux. And one of the main ones is obviously the mountains in the back. So um, during the nights, the cool air comes down from the mountains and it kind of lifts up uh, the warm air and as it mixes together this forms a fog and obviously chills down the region quite quite a lot. So even if the summers are relatively warm the winters tend to be quite cold in Turin. Correct me if I'm wrong guys. I don't think I am. No, it's true. It's true. All right. In terms of sand you've got loads of clay, loads of limestone and uh, quite a bit of sand there as well. Uh, which can give you an idea of what kind of uh, grapes we can we can talk about already. So where were we talking about uh, clay? Which region were we talking about when we were talking about clay, guys? Anyone? Bordeaux. 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 Beautiful. Thank you. So, which um, which grapes are grown in the clay part of Bordeaux? Cabernet. Clay part of Bordeaux. Merlot. Merlot. Why? Because he likes water. All right. So we already know if, uh, if Merlot likes water and you've got clay under Merlot and we've got clay here, we can expect the grape varieties that are here to like water as well. Um, on the other hand, we've got, for example, sand that is quite opposite and we know that sand doesn't 
really retain water all that well. If you just look at a desert, for example, even if there is rain, it doesn't stay in that for long because it just kind of runs through. So we can already see that there is going to be a similar thing to what we saw in Bordeaux, where we had two different types of soil, different grape varieties kind of growing on each other. Okay. All right, in terms of appellations, uh, the most interesting thing about uh, Piemonte is that they don't actually have any IGT. So IGT is Indicazione Grafiche uh, Geografiche Tipica. Am I saying that right? Um, so basically, an IGT one basically means um, a, a wine from anywhere in the in the region. It doesn't need to be anything specific. But Piemonte doesn't have that. It does, however, have some of the highest uh, number of DOCs and DOCGs, so denominazione origine controllata and garantita. Um, I think 80 something, 84, 85% of all of the region is actually under DOC. Um, so that's quite spectacular um, and it's unprecedented pretty much for anywhere else, especially because the region is not that small. Um, so that's quite interesting. In terms of the most important appellations, obviously we all have heard of Barolo. We have all hopefully heard of Barbaresco as well. Um, Garvi is quite an interesting one as well. Moscato d'Asti, Gattinara, Lange, Barbera d'Aldi, Barbera d'Asti. And I should have written Roero there as well. The reason why I should have written Roero is because if you look at the, the photo um, here, I mean, this is sand, right? This is nothing else but sand. And this is what Ro Roero is famous for. And when we get to it, um, when we cover it briefly, we'll, I'll explain why this is important. Okay, have you heard of all of the other regions? Gavi, Moscato d'Asti, Gattinara, maybe not really, huh? Anybody heard of Gattinara before? Gattinara, no. yes, but I didn't know from Piedmont. Okay, so Gattinara is just a little bit further from, from Asti. Uh, it's kind of on a, next to the lake. Beautiful, beautiful, very light, very fresh uh, wines uh, from Nebbiolo mostly. They actually make, in that area, they make some pretty beautiful Pinot Nero as well, so Pinot Noir. Um, so really, really lovely region. Very expensive actually, considering it's not that famous. But yeah, if you see Gatinara on the list, give it a go. Um, beautiful stuff. Okay, well now let's go to why, why Piemonte is Piemonte. And probably these are the... Barolo and Barbaresco are the two main reasons for it. Barolo first, because Barolo has a longer history um, of being successful, I would say, than Barbaresco. But both of these are the reason why Piemonte is considered one of the top regions. So Barolo is a relatively small region. Uh, they only produce about 500,000 cases of wine. So this is cases of six. Um, whereas Barbaresco is actually even smaller. It only produces about 200,000 of wine uh, cases. They are very different in terms of styles of wine and in terms of how they approach things um, commercially as well. So if, if you've been to, I mean, obviously some of you have been to Barolo, but Barolo has that very, so again, we are kind of a polarizing um, region. So same as we had in Bordeaux, uh, where you had um, kind of the, the left bank being the more prestigious, more of, about those chateaus and things like that. And then you had Burgundy that was more about like the little farmers. Similar thing is happening here where Barolo is more about these a little bit more prestigious wineries. It's all about tourist oriented. Um, you know, you have these Michelin star restaurants and things like that. Whereas Barbaresco, very different, very, uh, I mean, when you walk into Barbaresco, it's like, it's like walking into any kind of village, any kind of farm. And the picture in the back that I have is actually Barbaresco. It's one of my favorite villages that I've visited. Um, and it's just beautiful. If you ever go there uh, to the region, but all of Barbaresco, avoid all of the Michelin star restaurants and just go into any local uh, restaurant that is here. Some of the most amazing pasta and obviously they will have um, pretty spectacular um, truffles. You find a lot of truffles in Piemonte. So beautiful stuff there. I had the most amazing pasta there with truffles. Um, anyway, but uh, in terms of approach, that again means a very, very different thing. So because Barolo is more made for like the prestige market, more for the premium market and so on, even the wines are made in kind of that way where they are a little bit more structured, they're stronger. Um, about 20, 30 years ago, 
you really had to wait. And this is still kind of the case. If you want a Barolo to showcase its true uh, potential, you had to wait 10, 15 years um, just for it to soften up. So why does it need to be softened up in the first place? So the grape for Barola and Barbaresco and pretty much the most prestigious grape in Piemonte is called Nebbiolo. And the name comes from Nebbia, which is the Piemontese word for, for the fog. Uh, and I, as I mentioned earlier, you get a lot of fog in the area, mainly because of the mountains and that cool air that comes down. And again, as it mixes with the, the warm air, um, it forms this fog. And this fog is, is very, very important because it sits on just at the, the top of these hills where all the grapes are planted and it just cools them down. Um, so why is this important in the wine? Because the warm days produce rich fruits, rich, really structured fruits. It, the tannins ripen fully, but it also retains a lot of acidity. Uh, and that acidity, that freshness really brings out uh, the elegance in the grape. Um, so Nebbiolo, absolutely beautiful grape. Um, it is also the grape that will always kind of uh, play games on you. Um, if, if you pour a little bit of Nebbiolo in a glass, it's actually quite clear. Um, so it looks very light in the glass. Uh, and a lot of people make this mistake. They look at, this, they look at Barolo and they say, wow, it's such a, such a light wine because they think that the color will tell them that. But when you try it, it actually it kicks you on your, on your ass. Rich, bold, bold, very, very tannic. One of the most tannic grape varieties you will find. Um, and anyway, back to Barolo. So because they make it in such a structured way, the wines uh, tend to be ready later. They also have to be aged for a year more than Barbaresco. Uh, before release. Uh, so yeah, quite a different style. Barbaresco on the other hand, because it is made for as soon as possible consumption, because it's made for the local market, because it's made for, for the people that actually uh, drink it, uh, it is made in a much, much softer style. It, um, I mean, the region is just a little bit further northeast. It has a little bit more um, it has a different exposure. So it has uh, sunlight in different parts of the day uh, and for a little bit shorter amount of time. So you get a little bit fresher, a little bit more elegant, a little bit softer style uh, of wine here in Barbaresco. Uh, but yeah, two absolutely beautiful uh, regions. Um, so Barola and Barbaresco are both villages. They're actual villages, but the regions themselves um, kind of uh, go around them. So I think Barola is about seven by five miles um, in, in width and length and it's just kind of it's really cool because you've got all of these little villages like the one you see in the back and then if you look so you've got one here right you've got one here so it's it's like these villages are on top of these hills and then all of the hills are just surrounded by these vineyards so it's really really cool um, so even in distance you're like five miles away from each other but I can tell you that if you drive through the region it takes you forever because there's no direct lines you need to, the, the roads are curvy and yeah, it just takes you forever to kind of uh, travel along it. But absolutely beautiful if you ever go there, if you have the, 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 the what is, if you're in good shape enough, um, take a bike and go with a bike. Beautiful stuff. Anyway, um, but all, so Italy, unlike, uh, let's say, uh, Bordeaux and Burgundy, they don't really have uh, the crew classification in terms of quality. Like in Bur Burgundy, we had the Grand Cruise, the Premier Cruise, uh, and so on. They don't have that here. However, Barbaresco was one of the first regions in Italy to start producing crews in terms of uh, vineyard classification. So they would say, so this particular crew is different to this crew. They don't rate them in terms of which one is higher in quality. They just want to showcase um, that this is the the grapes from this for this wine came from a particular plot on that side of the hill or whatever. Um, so they were starting to introduce the the crew um, designation. It's not it's not legalized or anything, but they just they do follow it quite strictly. Um, some of the most important crews for Barolo are Knubi, Brunate, Faletto, Fiasque, and La Sera. You will see a lot of these on. Um, so what it will say, it will say Barolo Canubi, it will say Barolo Brunate, um, things like that. 
So it would still say Baral on the bottle, but this will just give you an indication that it comes from a smaller part uh, or a particular crew in that region. Uh, Barbaresco has Rabaya, Pora, Rio Sorda, and Sori San Lorenzo. So some pretty cool vineyards themselves as well. Um, basically, they're just, there's so many different types of, of soils uh, that you will find in Barola and Barbaresco. And, and the combination of them uh, is just so unique that like, that's why these crews are so important and that's why they kind of develop them. Okay. Um, any questions on Barola and Barbaresco? All right, so we've got other important grape varieties. As we've learned, uh, most, of the, most of the cities and, and things uh, and villages in Italy are built on hills. And this one in the back is pretty much the same. Does anybody know what this village is? No? Okay, I'll get to it, let me get to it. Okay, other important grapes in, in Piemonte, so. Veneto? Sorry? Veneto? No, 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 we're still in Piemonte. Oh. We're, not, we're not leaving Piemonte today. Um, anyway, so the other important grapes in... in is that Alba? No. Oh, Alba, Alba is one of the rare ones that it's not on the top of a hill. It's actually in the valley next to the river. Mm. Um, anyway, so Piemonte, uh, even though Nebbiolo is the most important, most prestigious grape, uh, it is very, very hard to grow, very, very fussy, very annoying uh, type of grape. So unless you know what you're doing and unless you have the absolutely perfect uh, vineyard for it, you need to plant something else, otherwise you're gonna starve. Um, and this is where Barbera comes in. And Barbera is much more um, independent, I would say. Um, and it's actually the most planted grape in all of Piemonte. Um, it's a little bit different to I like to compare Barbera to Merlot, and it's unfair to both of the grapes, but they do have some similarities, I find. Uh, Barbera does have a little bit more acidity than what you would, would find in Merlot. And I find that Barbera tends to be, uh, depending on where you grow it, it is very different to each other. So I generally hate Barbera. I think it's a boring, super, super stupid grape. But I had some Barbera that was grown on fantastic uh, Nebbiolo soil, so where they would generally plant Barolo and stuff like that, and that was magic. It is rich, it is structured, it is complex, it is very, very interesting. So don't completely write off Barbera just because there's a lot of it and a lot of it is just crap. Um, if you look for it, you can find some absolutely amazing wines and they're great value because Nebbiolo is very, very expensive because uh, it's hard to grow. Barbera isn't, so you get a much cheaper, much higher quality um, grapes. Um, generally, like I said, you will if you got a good vineyard, you're gonna plant Nebbiolo, because why would you plant anything else? This is how you're gonna make your money. Um, but yeah, Barbera has been getting into the mind of some of the winemakers, and they have started planting it on some of the Barolo and Barbaresco and Nebbiolo soils, um, just to kind of, showcase what the grape can do. Um, the other kind of important grape is Dolcetto. Um, so even though the, the name might suggest that it's a sweet grape, it's not. Dolcetto actually name comes from uh, having very tiny little berries, so like a little sweet tiny berries. Uh, nothing to do with the sweetness of the grapes. Um, it is a very light grape variety. Um, kind of soft, a little bit spicy. It produces um, bulk wine, basically. This is, I wouldn't say bulk wine because Dolcetto is not made to get, to make you money. Dolcetto is made um, so your family has something to drink every day of the week. Um, most Italian families will have a, a glass or a bottle of wine with their lunch, dinner, uh, hopefully not breakfast, but maybe. Um, so they do need some simple wine that will kind of still do the trick. Uh, and the Dolcetto kind of um, does that perfectly. It's very easy to grow, uh, produces a lot of volume. Uh, the wines are nothing spectacular, uh, but yeah, they, they just taste good. Uh, similar to Barbera, um, a lot of acidity. In general, in Italy, you need to remember, most Italian wines will have relatively high acidity. The reason for that is, so while most wine regions in the world will grow 
um, wine that goes with the, their cuisine, their local cuisine, nobody is as good at it as Italians are. So if you ask, if you ask me, or I would say that the best cooks in the world are the Italians. The best chefs might be the French, but the best cooks are the Italians. So when it comes to deliciousness and just um, putting consistently good food uh, on a table day in, day out, there's, I don't think there are many people better at it than the Italians. Um, so obviously they need it. They want their wines to match with that. So that's why they make it like that. And obviously acidity being a great component in terms of pairing, uh, they will generally favor that approach. So Arnais, uh, like I said, it's been it's been growing in in Piemonte for probably one of the uh, the longest times. Uh, there are historical documents even showing it to be there in the 14th century, which was before Nebbiolo. Uh, but the problem with Arnais was that it's a a white grape variety, uh, so didn't really work uh, with what they wanted to achieve there. Um, so it it almost became extinct. Um, I think in the 1960s only two producers stayed uh, on it. Everybody else pulled it out, so there was, it pretty much went extinct. Um, and even with these two wineries, they were close to kind of uh, calling it quits. Uh, but then they brought it back, and it's now kind of reliving um, a, new, a, a new dawn, I guess. Um, it's got a little bit of a resurgence coming up, and there's a lot of people producing it. Now, what's so good about Arnais is, again, high acidity, which we've we've discussed why already um it also has quite a rich full body um which is unusual for grapes with high acidity um, you know when we talk about other white full-bodied wines we're talking about chardonnay and viognier and they're rarely high in acidity whereas arnais is so that's a very interesting component to have um the other thing is in terms of flavor so it has these white florals um, and like a lemony freshness and I always get like a pine nutty note to it and that to me makes it perfect with pesto um, and anything built with uh, with pine nuts so beautiful grape variety and it is grown mostly on sandy soils so I remember in the picture before I was talking about Roero so in uh, through Barolo there's a there's a river uh, and that river divides the region into two bits. Uh, you've got the right bank and the left bank, similar to what you might find in Bordeaux. Um, and again, the right bank is kind of um, clay soils and it's more hilly, um, whereas the left bank is a little bit, it's, it's flatlands, it's more of the valley. It's where um, the city of Alba is and, and pretty much all of the industry as well. Um, <clears throat> and that left bank is all uh, covered with sandy soils. So they didn't originally plant any grapes there because they thought uh, sand can't uh, hold its own. But if we've learned anything in this series that we've been doing, what is what cannot survive in sand? Anyone? Phylloxera, exactly. So phylloxera cannot survive in sand, which brings us to Arnais, which is not grafted. It is on its own rootstock still and again that produces this beautiful rich full-bodied wines. Very very complex, very very interesting. Um, so most of the time you will find Arnais um, on the bottle it will say Roero Arnais. So Roero being the region on the left bank of the river being on sandy soils. The other bank of the river is called Lange. So if you see, for example, Lange Nebbiolo or Lange Barbera or something like that, just basically means that it's from clay soils on the right-hand side uh, of the river. So just to give you an idea of what those words actually mean, Lange and, and Uruero, I think both restaurants have uh, at least one of, one of the regions on their wine list somewhere. Okay. Um, another white grape, uh, very, very different to our nace, is Cortese. Does anybody know what it is the main grape for? Gavi. Gavi, indeed. And Gavi is in fact the village on the picture in the back. Uh, this is the, the village of Gavi. Um, so Cortese, uh, before Veneto and uh, Friuli started making white wine uh, properly, this is, Gavi was the, the only white 
wine that people were drinking, only prestigious, only premium white wine that people um, were taking kind of seriously. Um, because it just produces uh, cool wines. They're, they're dry, they're crisp, crisp. Um, again, quite floral, lemony, all of those aromas that work great with, with seafood and, and river food um, and things like that. Um, and Gavi as a region is a little bit further south than, than Alba, uh, where Barola and Barbara score. Um, so yeah, a beautiful wine. Uh, another white grape, uh, Moscato or Muscat or uh, there's another way, uh, and you can call it in Sicily, they call it Zibibo. Uh, but yeah, Muscat, uh, Moscato is a very aromatic grape variety. If you ever have it as a dry wine, it is probably the only grape variety that smells like grapes. Um, so most other grapes, uh, most other wines we will talk about, they have peachy and apricot and apple and whatever aromas. Uh, Moscato is one of the rare ones, or to my knowledge, the only one that I found so far. Uh, that distinctly tastes like grapes. Um, in terms of Piemonte, it is mainly used for the sparkling wine, the Moscato d'Asti, uh, which is a very low in alcohol wine, kind of sweet as well, very aromatic, like I said, and it's made in, in a similar method to what they make Prosecco with. Um, so very simple wine, just made to be delicious, nothing spectacular about it, but it is kind of popular. I don't see much of it in the UK. Um, not quite sure why that is, uh, but yeah, if you if you if you find it, give it a try. It's it's an interesting wine. You can it's, have it. Sorry, but it's not a proper sparkling wine. Why not? Is prosecco a proper sparkling wine? Well, um, well, I remember last back in the back in the days when I went to to try one. Is they explained it, but like. Is uh, he's got a touch of sparkling, but he, they don't want to make a, like a proper sparkling wine. But that's when they like the the the, the quality of the bubbles that they have is uh, is really delicate and really fine. That it's almost you feel the bubble, but it almost like it, you don't have that as well. True, and that but that is the approach. But it is a sparkling wine. It does have. It, it, Unlike uh, wines with high acidity that will have a, a spritz on them, this is actual sparkling wine. There's actual CO2 in these wines. Um, so there, it is a proper sparkling wine. The way they make it, yes, it's a little bit more delicate than uh, let's say the traditional method of, of champagne. Um, but yeah, it's, still, it's, a, it's a sparkling wine. Most important thing about Moscato is, is that it's low in alcohol. Sometimes you can get it for, with like two and a half percent of alcohol, which is nothing. Um, so yeah, this is good for pregnant ladies <laughs> and things like that. Anyway, um, in terms of grapes, you can find other stuff as well. Uh, there is some Merlots and Cabernet that is being planted. There's some Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, so pretty much anything. Um, there is some traditional method sparkling wine going around Piemonte as well. Uh, Bruno Giacosa, for example, makes a beautiful one uh, in, in, in his, um, I think he makes it in Lange as well, uh, mostly with Chardonnay. So there are other grape varieties. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention with Cortese, with Gavi. So I think it was up until 70s, 1970s, that Gavi was actually a sparkling wine as well, uh, which was, it was disgusting, it was horrible. Uh, but then they finally figured out that it's better as a still wine. So they, they moved it towards the still wines. But before that, yeah, it was actually a sparkling wine as well, uh, traditional method. Um, anyway, so yeah, loads of other grape varieties, but these are kind of the main ones. You do need to know Nebbiolo, you do need to know Barbera, Dolcetto, Cortese is very good to know. The others, maybe not as much. Uh, I would like you to know more about Arnais. I just find it to be a really, really good wine, really good value. Um, and like I said, great with food, very versatile. So um, I wish people got to know the grape a little bit more. Okay. All right, now let's finish off with some of the icons. Um, so in Barolo, you have Roberto Verzio, Bruno Giacosa, Vietti, Elio Altare, Pio Cesare, Roania, all of these guys, if you ever see their wines on the list, you can't afford them. <laughs> uh, maybe Vietti you can afford, uh, but yeah, the others not so much. Um, Bruno Giacosa and Vietti. Maybe Roania sometimes. You can afford Roania? 
in a restaurant is generally 200 quid. Huh? It's not that cheap. Um, Jacosa, Jacosa it will be even more. Vietti might be a little bit cheaper depending on the crew you get. Um, but yeah, even their Barolos, their, their Barolos are going to be 150 minimum. Uh, I mean, great if you can afford it. I, I wouldn't. If if I want to go for for a good wine like a, a good Barolo, I don't want to just spend 200. I would rather spend once 500 and have an amazing wine rather than have uh, the cheapest possible one for 200. That it's not just going to do it. You know what I mean? So that's why I'm talking, always trying to talk to you guys about these other regions like Barbaresco, for example, that is half the price of Barolo, and you get um, um, you can get a much higher quality pound for pound uh, wise. Um, anyway, uh, Jacosa and Vietti, why they're important is because of Arnais, like I said. So in the 70s, when the Ar Arnais was almost extinct, Jacosa and Vietti were the only two that were still growing it. And they're kind of, they're the main reason why they brought it back. Um, also, one important thing is that they went into very different directions uh, with Arnais. So Vietti made, focused more on the body, on the creaminess, on the kind of richness of the wine, whereas Jacosa went more towards the fresher style. So they kind of opened two schools for Arnais, and there's a few people that kind of make the Jacosa style, and there's a few people that make a Vietti style, which is very, very interesting, and that's why they definitely deserve to be uh, among the icons of, of Barolo wines. I mean, it's, um, I can't imagine never trying Arnais now that I have, so uh, we kind of owe it to them. Um, Elio Altare, also very important. He was one of the first guys that, that started so remember when I was talking about uh, Barolos being, you need to age them for a long time before they're ready because of all of these tannin and all of this structure. Um, so the reason why that, why that was happening was because they were using um, these massive uh, vats, massive barrels. So there were 800, sometimes even more than 800 liter barrels. Uh, they were called Botti. Um, and as we've learned about oak, a big barrel doesn't really influence much. So when they put the wine in, when they put the Nebbiolo in these big barrels, it, it took forever to soften up and to be ready to drink. So they had to age it for a very long time before it was ready. Um, but Elio Tare was one of the first guys that, that made more and more trips to Burgundy. So Burgundy isn't that far from Piemonte. Piemonte is literally just across the border from France. So France was a big influence on the region in terms of winemaking. Um, so they went there and they saw what they were doing there. And they saw everybody's putting everything in small little new oak barrels. So Elio and a few other guys um, started doing that to their, to their Barolos. And it was a, a pretty big fight. Um, so Italians like their tradition, they like their culture, and they, they don't want things to change. Um, so a lot of the producers didn't like that these new guys were trying to change the way they've been doing the wines uh, for hundreds of years. Um, so there was quite a bit of tension there, but um, once they started doing this, people could drink the wine. So you didn't have to wait 10, 15 years anymore. You could, you know, in four or five times, you could actually drink the wine already. Um, so gradually, a lot of the people started moving towards the usage of new oak and just kind of softening the wines up a little bit more. Um, but yeah, there are still two very strong fissures, uh, two very strong trends. So there's one there's a, one side of of Barolo and Barbaresco that still only uses the old barrels. So um, you need to do your research before you you try a wine if you if you can have it young. Basically, most sommeliers will will check it before they list it. So they will they won't list a wine that's not ready, but just in case. Um, so Elio was one of the first guys. He even fought with his dad. I think I think his dad was was a very old traditionalist guy, and Elio came in and. Yeah, they had a big, big ass fight about it. Anyway, so these guys are mainly for Barolo. Some of them do grow grapes in, in Barbaresco as well. But when it comes to Barbaresco, there is nobody more famous than Produttori del Barbaresco. And this is a cooperative. So like I said, Barbaresco is all about the farmers, all about the little guys. And Produttori del Barbaresco is basically, uh, all of them they put in uh, some, of, some of their top grapes and they make really, really outstanding um, wines. They're also, I think they're the only brand uh, in Barbaresco that produces wine from all of their crews, all of their little vineyards. Um, so yeah, quite spectacular. 
um, and relatively reasonably priced. They're not super expensive, um, so you can still afford them because they're cooperative and they're not about the money. They're, they are about the promotion of the region uh, themselves. Um, Muso is not really an icon, to be honest, uh, but we found this guy with, uh, with Wanderlust, one of our suppliers, um, well, he found them actually, but his wines are, they're really fantastic and really, really cheap, really good value. Small producer, he only makes about 50,000 bottles a year, I think, um, across all of the grapes. And he has some of the, some of the best vineyards in, in Barbarescu, in my mind. So uh, I just felt like it, it might be an icon one day. I think he got some really good high scores on, on some of the ratings lately. So I wanted to mention that. Um, Las Corca. So when we talked about Gavi and we talked about it being a premium grape variety, that's still a relative term. Gavi is still not a premium grape variety. It's still not a, sorry, a Cortese. Uh, it's still not a, you know, a Burgundy where it's going to be a wine that, that costs a hundred pounds or whatever. Unless, of course, it is Las Colca. And Las Colca is probably the, the best Cortese uh, winery in the world. Um, and their wines do cost 100, 200, 300 pounds. Really amazing Gavi, some of the best I've had. And their wines are made for aging. So where most Gavi is meant to be drunk very, very young, uh, Las Colca makes some supreme uh, quality wines that are really, really good for aging as well. And lastly, obviously I didn't forget about Gaia. Um, so for those of you who know who I'm talking about, um, don't worry, I'll explain everything. So, Angelo Gaia. Angelo Gaia uh, comes from the Gaia family. They've been making wine in Barbaresco for a very, very, very long time. Uh, but Angelo Gaia is again one of my renegade uh, winemakers that I keep coming back to. Um, he was, along with Elio Altare, one of the guys that uh, brought in new, vi new viniculture, viticulture um, to the region. He wanted to improve the grape varieties. He wanted to improve the grapes, the, the wines that they were making and everything. Uh, because he's, he always felt that Barbaresco was, was uh, overlooked. Uh, he hated the Barolo, got so much more attention than Barbaresco. And they are, he is based in Barbaresco, in the village. Um, so one of the first things that kind of, uh, how he made a name for himself, uh, was that he started blending grapes. So you are not allowed to blend grapes in Piemonte. If it's, if it's a Barbaresco, it needs to be 100% Nebbiolo. There is, no, there is no, no budging on that. But he said, I want to I, I blend some Barbera in. And he started blending Barbera in. Uh, and he, that, of, of course, meant that he had to take away his, uh, uh, his appellation name. So on his labels, for a long time, you didn't see Barbaresco written on. Uh, it just said... Uh, um, what did it say? He had names for for each and every. So there was a Sorry San Lorenzo, for example. There was a from from just under the hill on the picture behind us. Um, so yeah, he just had the name of the vineyard on it or the name of the wine. Let's say one of the fun ones was the Darmaji as well. Uh, Darmaji in local dialect means something like God damn it. Um, and this was, or no, it means, uh, what, what a shame, I think. <clears throat> and that name came from when Angelo came to his dad and said that he wants to plant Cabernet Sauvignon in, in Piemonte. In, in, not only that, in Barolo soil. So, yeah, he pulled the Nebbiolo grapes out and his dad just looked at him and said, oh, what a, what a shame what you're doing, son. Um, but yeah, Gaia planted then the Cabernet, so he's the first guy that, dared to completely oppose tradition uh, and, and plant Cabernet in all Nebbiolo land, all Italian grape variety land. They, there was no other uh, international grape varieties around. Um, so again, yeah, he's one of the guys that pissed everybody off. Um, that being said, he is a family man and his winery is still owned by his whole family. He's still in charge, uh, kind of, his daughter Gaia, Gaia Gaia, funny guy, um, is kind of the main ambassador for the, for the winery now. And she's actually a very, very smart girl because 
Um, so they still live in Barbaresco, even though they they're so rich that they don't know what to do with their money. They even bought this castle in the picture in the back and completely refurbished it for millions and millions of pounds because they have so much money. Uh, but they're still a native to the village, and especially Gaia is very attached to the village. So she convinced his dad to stop blending this bloody Barbera into the Nebbiolo and start calling his wines Barbaresco again. And the reason why she wanted to do this is because she said, if you do things your own way, dad, you are just promoting yourself. But if you do it the right way, then you can drag the whole region behind you. Um, so he finally listened to reason, listened to, to Gaia, and now his wines are back to being labeled correctly. So they are Barolos, they are Barbarescos, and they're not blends anymore. Um, because he said, she, she basically convinced him to, uh, she, she told him, if you're so good, you can make a wine uh, good regardless uh, of the blending. Uh, and yeah, he did it. So there we are, here we are today. Um, anyway, other things about Gaia. So they, are, they will never say they're bi biodynamic or organic, but they are completely organic. Um, they are, they're very deep into encouraging um, their flora and fauna around their, their vineyard. So under this vineyard, so the, the picture in the back, so this is the castle that I was talking about. And under this castle, there's the Sori San Lorenzo, their, their top vineyard, top Barbaresco vineyard that is. Um, and they basically have uh, beehives all over the place. So if you don't know about this, if you if bees survive in your in your um, uh, ecosystem, it means that you have a very clear air, very good environment. Um, so they're really trying to actively encourage this. They even make their own honey uh, and things like that. So they're all about kind of um, encouraging nature to show them what to do better. Um, so yeah, very very important producer. Um, some there is nothing cheap from them. The cheapest wine that they do will still retail for about sixty quid, uh, and it's a it's a very entry level blend. Um, they also make some outstanding Chardonnays, um, and yeah, he's got some super stupid names on the wine. So there's there's um, a Chardonnay called Rossi Bass, and it is spelled Ross J minus B A S S. It's named after Rosanna, one of his daughters, but yeah, just he's got weird names with his wines. Um, so anyway, that's it for, for Piemonte. That's it for today. Um, guys, any, any questions about this? Anything? What about Conterno? Um, is, yes. Is there I icons or used to be icon? Because, for example, I used to hear a lot about Conterno before. Uh, when I write in London and I started working in a restaurant, a lot of People, a lot of restaurants were having Conterno, but now is less that I know. Um, in my mind, that's mostly due to money, I think. Um, he is an icon, definitely, Giacomo Conterno. So why I didn't mention him, and it's a very logic explanation for this. If you go to, if you go to Barolo, there is about 10 different Conternos that are none of them related. You have Franco Conterno, you have Giacomo Conterno. There's so many Conternos. And you get confused, and I, that's why I specifically never mention him, because if you if you look at the bottle and you say, "Oh, look, Conterno, that must be very good," and then you get a crap wine because it was one of the other Conternos. Um, so that's why I didn't mention him. But yeah, Giacomo Conterno is um, a fantastic winemaker as well uh, for for Barolo. Um, a little bit expensive these days, so like I said, that's why you might not see him as much. Um, but yeah. Definitely an icon, yes. Thank you. Anything else, guys? Okie dokie. So that's it for today. And on Thursday, we are going to do Tuscany, I think. Yeah, I think we're Ooh. just... Yeah. Tuscany. Yeah, I think we'll just do Tuscany. So like I said, because we've got a little bit more time than I thought we do, uh, I'll try to extend them a little bit more. So we still went quite fast through Barolo and Barbaresco, uh, but at least imagine if we did the all of Italy today, right? It would be impossible. Um, so yeah, we'll do, I think we'll just do Tuscany next week, maybe Veneto as well. Um, and then, yeah, we'll do the rest. I think what we'll do, we'll do Tuscany on Thursday and then next Tuesday we'll do Veneto and, and rest of Italy. 
think that will make sense. And then we'll move on to, to the rest. Okay? Mm -hmm. Amazing. Okay, doc. So I will upload this presentation in, yeah, I'll, I'll do it now. So it'll be up in five minutes or so. And then uh, the video will be up in five, six hours, whenever I have time. Um, so yeah, you can go back to it. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.